Welcome everyone. I am excited to have David Beckworth here today for our next episode of the Stay at Home Macro Podcast. So today we're going to be talking about monetary policy and some new research and proposals that David has. And I always, um, that David has, David is a research fellow in the program of monetary policy at the Mercatus Center at the George Mason University. David is joining us today from Nashville, where he lives, and um, I've also met with David a few times in Arlington at the, the Mercatus Center. So I'd like to start out with a brief connection to how I know the guests, the amazing guests that we have on the show. And so David, as many of you may know, runs a Macro Musings podcast series out of the Mercatus Center. Every week he has on distinguished macroeconomists in both academia and policy world to talk about lots of different topics in macro. And I was had the pleasure of David asking me early on in the show if I would come on and be a guest. And after multiple requests, every one of them denied by public affairs at the board. Um, you know, I am persistent and as is David. And so I've had a chance this last year to be on the show twice. So that is excellent. And I am so thrilled to be able to turn the tables on David today and interview him and get him to talk about his research. So why don't we start, David, with you telling me a little bit or telling all of us a little bit about how you got started in economics, what your path is, like what's, what's your story that got you up to today? All right, well, thank you for having me on, Claudia. And yes, you were a hard one to catch <laughs> for the show, but I finally got you. So uh, thank you for being a regular guest in the program. So I did not have a traditional uh, path to this profession. I went to a small college as an undergrad that didn't even have an econ degree, although they had some economic courses. And I remember taking principles of macroeconomics and just blew my mind away. In fact, there was a number of us guys, a group of us that hung together, and I was more of the jock in the group, and there were some smarter guys in the group, and I would blow them out of the water on the test, and they were all shocked and amazed in <laughs> principles of macro. But it never dawned on me this could be a career until I went to work on an MBA. And while I was there, I was taking some more econ courses. And I picked up a book at a used bookstore called Secrets of the Temple by William Grider. And uh, it's, he's kind of a populist, kind of left-leaning, much for the nation. But it's a, it's a riveting account of the Federal Reserve during the Volcker years. Mm -hmm. And it really lit my fire. I was like, man, this is fascinating stuff. I would love to do this for a career. And, and this began to slowly dawn on me, I could do this. So I went back to grad school. Um, probably another big step in my journey was right after grad school, I worked at the US Department of Treasury. And that opened up a lot of opportunities for me, networking. John Taylor was my boss several layers up, but he's very accessible, very friendly, had a lot of smart people around me. Some today who've gone on to become PhD economists too. And, just a great experience. It opened my mind to the policy world, it took me out of the you know strict, narrow mathematical world of macro and it really showed me there's a lot more to learn beyond models. Um, so that was, that was a rich experience. And then I, I went on to some state schools, ended up at Western Kentucky University. And I was doing a lot of um, writing, a lot of policy writing on the side. So I was doing my traditional research and then policy writing. And that opened up doors and eventually I got a call from Mercatus and here I am. Yeah. No, that's a great story. And I think it reinforces, we don't all end up, we may end up in similar kind of roles, but the paths to it are wide and varied. And that's really good, Absolutely. you know, because it brings in different experiences and perspectives. So what sport did you play in college? You said you were the job. Well, I didn't play, I was, it was more intramurals, but basketball, basketball. Okay. I love, I still love basketball. There's a group of us who still play Sunday morning. So Sam Bell and I, another friend of ours, play basketball together. <laughs> so, oh, I didn't know Sam. I grew up in Indiana, so I played basketball. Oh, okay. Well, all the way are you a big college basketball fan then? Uh, yeah. So my all my family went to Purdue University. Okay. And I love MBA and cut. Yeah. So I basketball is always on at home, except not now because you know. Right. Right. Okay. But yeah. So next time we we uh, are together, we're gonna play some horse. I'll beat you. Okay. Game on. Um, <laughs> not competitive or anything. Okay, so, um, no, and this is great. And I will say, David, you're one of those people that just loves monetary policy. 
and the Fed, like it's rare for me, and Sam Bell's another good example, where I can find people that love the Fed as much as I do, and like all the gory details and read the transcripts. So that's really great. And I, um, as we're gonna get talking about in terms of monetary policy, it, it's good to have people who are thinking big and broad because the Fed is facing challenges that it hasn't faced in its full history. So we need lots of creative ideas. And that's why I love you know, talking with you and kind of kicking around ideas. So the big idea, the one that I think you are most well known for is nominal GDP targeting. So can you just give us like, a basic description of that, what it is, why why this is important, like what, why do we need another target? Okay, so let me give you two ways to think about it in a very hopefully easy and accessible manner. So nominal GDP targeting is a mouthful, it's not probably the ideal way to market it, but what it amounts to on one hand is the total amount of spending in the economy in dollar terms. So Literally, if we go out and we add up all the spending in the U.S., current value added spending, um, that is nominal GDP. And what a target for nominal GDP does, it says, let's keep that stable. Let's don't let it collapse. Let's, the, let's avoid it growing too rapidly. But stabilize total spending in the economy. So that's one way to look at it. Another way, which may be even better or easier to think about, is for every dollar spent, there's a dollar earned somewhere. And so if you're stabilizing total dollar spending in the economy, you're also stabilizing total dollar incomes earned. So this has also been called a nominal income target or total dollar income target. And, and it's important because people make decisions based on their salaries, what they think they're gonna be making this year, next year, the following year, you take out a mortgage you're implicitly forecasting you're going to have a steady flow of, of income coming home to pay for that mortgage or car payment. Mm -hmm. Or if you're a business, you know, do, you, do I take a lease out? Do I commit to long contracts for raw materials? All these are based on some implicit, maybe sometimes explicit forecast of income. And you want to stabilize that. Otherwise, you're going to have a hard time meeting these contracts and expectations you've maintained. So like in the current crisis, um, I think it's, it's a great application to think about this. There's some things we can't fix. Monetary policy can't fix the fact that people are sick, factories have shut down. But what it can do is avoid the secondary spillover effects from people who've, who've committed to mortgages, to business leases, that will make them insolvent if they can't meet those pre-existing financial conditions. And a nominal income target, a nominal GDP target allows them to do that. And where it's different than where we are today is today the Fed focuses on, I mean, it has a dual mandate, but there's a lot of weight put on inflation. And it's a very kind of, you know, keep inflation low and stable, where a nominal GDP target, maybe we'll get into this later, it allows a little more flexibility in the near term, what happens to inflation. Although over the long term, it still stabilizes long term inflation. It's less concerned about inflation in the short term. It's all about stabilizing dollar incomes or sta stabilizing total dollar spending. Yeah, no, that's a great, great explanation. I appreciate you kind of coming at it from two directions. And this is one, when you see economic commentary, like in the newspapers, you know, once a month when the uh, gross domestic product, so GDP report comes out, there's a lot of discussion about that, a lot of discussion about real GDP. So price right. adjusted, inflation adjusted. What doesn't get as much coverage in that report is the Bureau of Economic Analysis also puts out a gross domestic income statistic. And that's exactly, GDP is much more aligned with the spending concept, hence you call it NGDP targeting. But the income for every, like the output side of GDP, it matches up or is supposed to match up with the income side, which is GDI. So I agree, I think income is a lot more intuitive to think about, and yet, studying consumer behavior for a long time, income and spending match up pretty closely for a lot of people. So, you know, two, two sides of the same coin. Um, yeah, so why don't, I mean, I have tons of questions and things I wanna pull out of this, sure. but why don't I go ahead and let you get started talking through some of your recent research and explainers, like kind of go more into the details. So you have a um, paper out, I don't know, last year, a little little time ago, that's called the facts, fears, and functionality of nominal GDP targeting. 
so like let's take it step by step but i think you've established some you've established the facts and kind of describing it is there anything else you'd want to put on the table maybe like in the current context like how far is the fed from doing something that looks like target like keeping a nominal gdp nominal income national income stable Oh, they're a long ways from it, as you can imagine. And it's not really their fault. This is the huge shock. I don't think any type of monetary policy regime could have handled this like immediately. It'd take time to heal from this. But what I'm advocating and what others are advocating, advocating is a version of this that will allow the Fed and maybe even force the Fed to be aggressive during the recovery. So if I might maybe go into the difference between a level target and growth rate target applied to this particular concept. So a, a, a level target, and that's what we typically advocate with nominal GDP targeting, is one where you make up for past mistakes, whether you overshoot or undershoot. In most cases, it's undershooting. We don't have a what whole do you, What do you mean by that? What's the level? Is that the total dollars, the yeah. total income? Okay. So, so the level would be the total dollar size of the economy. So you think every year it's going to grow a certain amount, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, four or five percent. And you can think of, you know, two percent real growth, maybe two percent inflation. So let's say roughly four percent over the past decade. You want the dollar size of the economy to stay on that stable path, a growth path or the level, the actual dollar mm -hmm. level size. Again, because people have made decisions based on the expectation. Now, each person's going to be idiosyncratic. You know, Claudia, you're more productive than I am, so you may get a big pay raise relative to me. But on average, there's, there's, this, there's this kind of core component. We all have some kind of anchored amount of, of dollar income, which the Fed over the long run can influence. Short run, again, is less control. But the idea is you want to preserve those expectations, preserve that, that level, that that, that dollar amount where we thought the Fed would be. And this shock has clearly like thrown us off. Let me explain it this way. I like to well, use- I, Before you get going, how does, I get it this shock is just came out of nowhere. It's totally massive. But if you look back over the last 10 years, like even as we, like say February, like if you look from February back 10 years, then does it look like the Fed was doing it? The way it it actually, it does. If If you take as a starting point, you know, summer 2009, mm -hmm. it's a pretty straight line for nominal income or nominal GDP. So in fact, uh, Carola Binder has a great paper that just came out in the Cato Journal. She gave this talk at the uh, Cato Monterey Policy Conference. She's a great economist. You know her well, because I think your research overlaps with hers. She had did a paper where, where she, among other things, she said, look, it would have been a lot easier if the Fed had just said we're going to adopt a, a nominal GDP level target starting in 2009, and they would have easily hit it, you know, um, much more so than their inflation target. And, and the point of her paper is a nominal GDP target is a whole lot better in a world of, of populism, unhappy campers, and it's in some ways easier to implement, and the Fed could have done better. So, yeah, the Fed effectively did something like this, not you know, by design, but it, it kind of fell out of what they did. Um, the question then though, is in a crisis like this or in 2008, can they make up for what has been thrown at them? Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the, the big question. And, and to me, this is a big deal. And, and to be fair, if there's people out there who prefer an inflation target, there's a version of that called a price level target where you make up for misses in the inflation target. But I, I think it's, it creates problems we get into later. So let me tell the story, if I may, Claudia, mm -hmm. of why you want to make up for these past misses. I've already alluded to it, but this is the way I like to think about it, a very accessible kind of a story, an analogy of sorts. And that is imagine that a highway is the economy. So a bunch of cars are driving on this highway. Cars represent businesses, firms, entrepreneurs, and inside the drivers are the laborers, the people, the managers of the firm. All right, so driving down the highway, you want to go as fast as you can, but at a sustainable pace. You don't want to go too fast and massive wrecks. You don't want to go too slow and, and waste precious time. So you want everyone to be coordinated, doing their thing, driving, getting to their destination at a speed that's, that's maximally sustainable. So let's just say for the sake of argument, it's 65 miles an hour. Maybe in Indiana, it's a little bit higher. I know in North Dakota, it's like 70 or 80. Yeah. But you're driving along at 65 miles an hour, 
and and you have to be somewhere and you plan a trip out and you're gonna you plan to average 65 miles an hour you get stuck in a traffic jam a traffic jam would amount to a recession everyone stops and, and there's different reasons i want to get into right now but later we can talk about why why you get in a traffic jam but a traffic jam you've got to get around wrecks you, people are rubbernecking there's a coordination failure and you need everyone to kind of take off and get going again well if you're stuck in traffic and you, 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 you've lost precious time and you want to get to your destination on time, you've got to actually drive faster than 65 miles an hour for some period. Not mm -hmm. the whole time, but you've got to maybe do 75, 85 for a while and then get back down to 65. So what you want to do is on average have a speed limit of uh, an average speed of 65 miles an hour, but that requires speeding up after the traffic jam. The U.S. economy is the same way. During a recession, you lose ground, and you got to make up for that lost ground by growing the economy a little more rapidly, a little hotter than normal, eventually going back to a normal pace. A level target empowers and allows the Fed to do that. A growth rate target, like inflation targeting, first sign of heat, the Fed's going to get nervous and, and want to hit the brakes. And I guarantee this is going to happen, unfortunately, in this crisis, because we haven't made a, a switch to a level target. But as soon as we see inflation go north of 2%, 2.01%, you're going to hear calls. Ah, oh, here it is, you know, and it's going to create panic and the Fed's going to feel pressure from politicians, from journalists, from well-meaning people. But we should be willing to tolerate a little bit faster than normal inflation and real growth to make up for lost time. A level target does that. And in my particular case, I want it to be a nominal GDP level target or a nominal income level target. Um, yeah. But I think that's a huge deal. Um, I think it's a reason we still should be talking about the Fed's review, even though the Fed's punted on it. I understand why. All right, the Fed's let's, here, I'm going to interrupt you. Okay. We'll get to the. I know I'm very excited about the review. Okay, I'll, it's sorry. a little um, maybe off track right now. No, but I do. I I really love the analogy of the highway and making up for lost time. Uh, one of the things, you know, having started the Fed in the summer of 2007, being on the staff macro forecast through the crisis the hardest time for me at the Fed as someone who was focused on consumer spending and household finances, the hardest time was around 2011. Like it was in the recovery where we kept saying, and it wasn't, we weren't this V-shaped recovery, we're going to snap right back. I mean, 2008 was a very severe uh, shock to the economy, but there was this, it's going to recover. Is going to recover, and every time the data come in, we're like, ah, it's not there. And I can remember doing forecast after forecast, saying there's no reason to think that American consumers are going to bounce back this fast. And one of the things, like when I think about your car analogy, there's an aspect. Of, well, you got to put your foot on the gas, right? Like the car yeah. doesn't just like zoom, start moving. And I think there's a lot of thinking in macroeconomics, and some of it makes sense, and some of it doesn't that the economy has a way of healing itself you know and so if you think the economy just on its own after the traffic jam starts cranking again then the fed doesn't put its foot on the gas the same way and that was something as the recovery went on and the federal reserve even though they kept saying we're going to get two percent inflation we're going to get prices rising by two percent a year and all the way up to february they hadn't <laughs> they hadn't managed to do it and that's almost incomprehensible in monetary policy because the Fed should just be able to set prices and eventually it gets there. And the staff for years have been telling them, you, if you really want to, you, you got to do more. And they didn't. But I mean, to your point, like things by February of this year were really pretty much back on track. It was just a very painful, like, yeah. So I, I think your idea, and it's one where, like, when I first heard Scott Sumner on his, his blog, Money Illusion, because he was one that I had, when I first went online and social media and, you know, yeah. on blogs, like, he was very um, loud about it. Louder right. and more aggressive than I feel like when I talk to you. Um, <laughs> but it was just one of those, like, I'd never heard anything like that in taking macro in grad school, never heard anyone at the Fed talk about it, even though it has a long history so I remember mean, Bernanke had written on similar things it was just part of like that was totally missing from my macro education and the more I hear about it the more I hear like your work and Corolla's and after I finally like got over Scott's kind of aggressive like 
you're wrong about this. Um, like it just, it really kind of grows on you. And this idea that it's so straightforward. I mean, relative, I mean, it's still monetary policy. The Fed is still like, you know, the um, hard to understand, but this, you know, this feels like something that one could explain. And I love the highway. Um, okay, so, now I want to, so that really helps with the facts and kind of setting it up. So if this is such a straightforward, great idea, like why doesn't the Fed do this? So what are they so afraid of? Or like, what is it about this that just like the people who make decisions about monetary policy are just like, no way? Well, that's a great question. Um, let me answer it first by a little history. So this idea was actually advocated in the 1980s. In fact, late 70s, 80s, it was a pretty hot thing. So by no means Scott Sumner or any of us who, who write on it now like original. This is an old idea. Mm -hmm. And what happened, at least is my understanding is what happened. And I've talked to Jeff Frankel at Harvard because he was a part of this mm -hmm. debate in the 80s. He still is an advocate of nominal GDP targeting. But he said what happened is you had all these people talking about nominal GDP targeting. But then what happened is, is New Zealand, Bank of New Zealand introduced inflation targeting. And then it caught on mm -hmm. like wildfire. And so the interest quickly waned. People didn't care as much. It was all about inflation targeting, inflation targeting. So it, it had a moment and then it fell. And I think the reason it's hard now for it to be, you know, widely understood and maybe even adopted is just it's, it's not the easiest thing to explain off the cuff um, unless you are like me and you and you spend a lot of time in this. Um, I've, I, I can tell you this. I've talked to some senior Fed officials, um, and one of them told me, he goes, David, I'm trying really hard to fall in love with nominal GDP targeting. <laughs> I said, great. I was like, what can I do to get you past the, into the end zone, past the finish line? He goes, how do you communicate it? And that's where I had to really pitch him and sell him on. Think of this as you're trying to stabilize people's incomes. That's mm -hmm. the way you sell it. So it, it's, I think it's framing before nominal GDP targeting, stabilizing demand. That, that may be a little more form, but if you can approach it from a, an income side. In fact, I, I think, you know, if you're clever, you can pitch it to many groups. So if, if you're trying to reach like workers, labor groups, you talk about stabilizing incomes. If you're talking to trade groups, you're trying to stabilize revenue, sales, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it has a wide appeal. And, and I, it's just a matter of, of getting it across. Um, 2011, the Fed actually talked about it back when you were at the Fed. The, the FOMC talked about it, and they chose. They, I don't know how serious they were, but Bernanke talks about it in his book. It's in the minutes, but they ultimately dismissed it. It's, it's too hard to try at this time. So, it's. I don't have a good answer other than it was almost an, an idea that came to fruition in the 80s. It seemed too complicated in 2011 because of what is this? So mm -hmm. communication is key, and that's why I'm glad you have me. You have yeah. me on the show to help. Yeah. It. Well, I guess one thing, uh, and, and you know this too, the Fed expanded its toolkit a lot after 2008 because they couldn't push their interest rates any lower, the yeah. federal funds rate. One of, the, one of the items they put in the toolkit was communication policy, forward guidance. Mm. I am utterly unimpressed with uh, Fed officials' ability to communicate anything and to realize, um, I mean, there there's studies that have shown that the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, their statement that comes out the day of the meeting, which is relatively short, went from being something you had to have, you know, have freshman or sophomore level reading skills to like basically having a doctorate degree. Like it became so incomprehensible. So I, I don't know. I think personally, I think, you know, keeping income steady makes a, is a lot easier to explain than like price inflation has to be too. And so I, you know, monetary policy is a challenge. It's technical. Yeah. Tools are technical. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think they get off the hook by, we don't know how to well, I had, explain this. <laughs> I had another central bank official from the Bank of England talked to me and I tried to pitch nominal GDP targeting on him. He goes, oh, come on, David. And I was like, well, how about the nominal income approach? He goes, well, what are you going to tell someone whose income isn't growing as rapidly as the average? But I can throw that back at someone with inflation targeting because when you, you know, look at the price of gasoline, you're misled. So there's always going to be a relative 
income, relative price, confusion, no matter what approach you take, you know? Well, and looking at stable growth of income, I feel like, you know, I know you're looking at in terms of aggregate income, it feels like it'd be much easier to pull that apart into income inequality or growth at different yeah. parts of the distribution. It would be really hard to do that in terms of prices because the basket, like what people are buying is so different at different right. levels. So I think it has a lot of potential. Oh, I agree with you. Absolutely. From that point. Um, and I will say as a little Fed factoid, I mean, we, you were really close to getting uh, oh, nominal really? GDP targeting in the real world. In I think it was a 2011 was when the European crisis was brewing up. And the Federal Reserve, I, I have the utmost respect for them in that they're never out of, out of ammo. Like whenever their toolkit was kind of like, oh, we've tried this, we've tried that, Ben Bernanke would send out a blue sky email and be like, okay, what do we, you know, what's next? And I can remember a senior officer who wasn't supposed to tell us this, but it was like a readout on an FOMC meeting said, basically, if Europe had really struggled, the nominal GDP targeting was next. Like the Fed wow. has been absolutely like they will never do the negative interest rates, much, much to Miles Kimball's chagrin, who's from <laughs> Michigan. But there's just, there's all kinds of reasons we won't talk about that one. But I mean, it was... It, there was a very serious discussion oh, no, and the minutes in the transcript. So you were close. I'm glad that Europe pulled through and they didn't have to do that. But I think that just shows how much, um, how serious that was considered. Um, and it will be interesting if the Fed ever does its framework review. Like they've been doing a framework review going back and thinking about their tools for the last year. Um, they've been kind of busy with other stuff because um, oh, it was okay, supposed right. to come out in June. And I, I will be really interested to see how much discussion that got. And, and there's some, anyways, we don't have to get into all the technical pieces of it, but I feel like there's policies, if not exactly that, are kind of in the spirit of making up for past mistakes yeah. or past yeah. like disruptions in the economy. So that's good. You've had an impact. You brought it back in style. So, um, okay. So we've talked a lot about this kind of like the setup and the pieces and why they haven't, but should do it. Okay. So, but your recent paper, the one that came out in March, about mid March. So right after the world really started falling apart in the United States, you have a proposal that thinks about this COVID-19 crisis how nominal GDP targeting could fit in, but in a, like it's a, it's a proposal. It's like a very functional, like you do A, B, C, and D, and you need all these pieces. So can you walk me through like what, what this plan is? Yeah, so it actually, um, the idea I presented at a paper late last year that just came out now, but it's an idea of giving the Fed a, a target, nominal GDP level target, as you mentioned, but you give it two different rules based on where interest rates are. So if interest rates fall down to 0%, and that is the lower bound for the Fed, even though in theory could go negative, in all practical purposes, zero is the limit for the Fed. So when you hit zero, then what the Fed effectively turns to is the monetary base, starts buying up assets, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, but you want to guide those purchases with a level target, whether above zero, below zero. But then the other thing I add is, is to add helicopter drops. So if you hit zero, then the Fed gets a standing fiscal facility that allows it to send checks directly to households. And my hope is, my goal is, the Fed would only have to use this a few times and, it'd be, and it would make the level target so credible that you would rarely get to the zero lower bound. Um, but in a situation like this, big, big shock would be very useful. Um, and, and I think, you know, as I read the news, we see, you know, in fact, I read a story just today that um, it's unlikely Congress is going to get much done this summer because of the, the riots, the protests, um, on top of the COVID challenges. That means no more fiscal policy through traditional channels. Well, if you had the Fed set up in a rules-based, predictable, systematic, you know, it's, it's governed, they could apply that same, you know, ability 
in a systematic manner as long as we're below this, this threshold of 0%. And I think there's a place for that. I, I know there's some danger involved in giving the Fed that responsibility. The Fed doesn't want it, I believe I've heard that said. So the Fed couldn't do this right now? I mean, has the Fed yeah. ever done anything like this before? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I'm maybe, maybe 1930s they've done stuff, but, but technically it's fiscal policy mm -hmm. and it would need, I mean, I've heard some clever arguments how the Fed could tap into its equity and send checks out directly, but you would be pushing legal boundaries. The, the most expedient way to do this would be get approval from Congress. And again, my proposal would be have a standing fiscal facility that can only be used in emergencies defined by hitting zero and you're, and you're below your target. Um, and then the Treasury Secretary has to sign off on it and then they use it. So in some ways, it's not much different than what the, CARE, the CARES Act, the Treasury Secretary signed off, said here's all this money for facilities, run with it. Mm -hmm. But this would be a more systematic way. I mean, the thing about the CARES Act, what the Fed's doing now, and this is my concern, as I mentioned earlier, they're throwing money here and there, but it's not, there's no guiding framework. Mm -hmm. they're, gonna, they, they're gonna run out of steam politically, the, the energy's not there. You need a framework. Somehow put the pieces of the puzzle all together and, and a level target does that. And I've proposed that plus, give the Fed in emergencies fiscal authority to send checks directly to households. Yeah, no, and I think what you see in the CARES Act and some of the, the coordination, some of the authority that Treasury gave the Federal Reserve even in March, earlier in March, is the Fed being able to step in and be the lender of last resort. So there were a lot of financial markets, everything from treasuries to mutual funds, to, I mean, just you name it. There, in March, there were a lot of disruptions in financial markets and the Fed, I mean, it's the reason we have the Fed is right. to be a lender of last resort in a financial crisis. And, but that's really important in March, but that's actually not what we need right now because people don't need loans. Businesses don't need more loans. Municipalities don't need, they need money. And typically money, I mean, Congress is the one institution in the country that can just print money, you know, use treasury as the piggy banks, sell bonds. Um, but if Congress doesn't do that, the Fed is, has lending authority and that's it as of right now. Um, but as I like to say, I mean, money finance fiscal policy or helicopter drops, this is essentially like the nuclear weapon of monetary policy. Um, can you talk a little bit more about because I mean, on one level, you know, the, the Fed just send, send money out. So this, the meme of the money printer go, Brr. like, this just sounds like, well, yeah, send us money. So why, why do, like, when you say this around money, macro, they're just like, what, what is it that's so, um, like, what are the risks of doing something like this? Well, when you do a helicopter drop, you're effectively expanding the Fed's balance sheet on the liability side, but not the asset side. And that's a mouthful. But effectively, you're creating a hole in the finances of the government because you're, you're just literally, not literally, but you're figuratively <laughs> dropping money out of helicopters. You put it in the check accounts. And in the future, let's just say in the future, this money gets out of control and velocity goes up and lots and lots of spending. Inflation hits 10%, let's say. Well, then you want to pull that money in. Well, with the, normally the Fed would have all these assets it could sell, pull the money in. Mm -hmm. With a helicopter drop, you don't have that. So you're going to have to raise taxes, sell bonds. It's, so it's a little trickier, a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I say tie it to a level target. You don't use it all the time. You, you bring it up to a level target. And, and, and I believe it would make the level target so credible you wouldn't have to pull the money back out. If, if everyone knew the Fed was going to tighten, if, if inflation got too high or normal GDP got too high, you wouldn't see velocity take off. But the danger is you literally put money out there with that, without matching assets they can sell to pull it back in in the future. And um, that's something typically Treasury does, but not with the Fed. The Fed's very conservative, as you know, and once they have a solvent balance sheet of its own. Right. No, and I think just to draw out a few things you'd said that maybe wouldn't, you know, appear to listeners like it's so important. One thing that you've mentioned a couple of times is having a rule, right? So that there's, yeah. like you said, a framework, a target. And 
And also your rule tells the Fed when to start and when to stop. So in the last year, I've done a lot of work on automatic stabilizers. So like fiscal policy, things that what Congress would do to spend money, like send checks to people, and using economic conditions, like say an increase in the unemployment rate or the unemployment rate coming back down to say, okay, this is when you start and this is when you stop. And those rules, it's interesting, these are really popular among economists, although economists don't actually like to follow rules, but they like to tell other people to. Um, right. So this idea of, it takes, I mean, we're always gonna make mistakes, but it means like we kind of, we sit down ahead of time and think about, okay, in a crisis, in a severe recession, what should we think about in terms of when it's right to, to act? Um, and when it's right to stop acting? Because I think you mentioned this before too, uh, the biggest danger now, and I, I see this too, is that we won't do enough, right? I think the Federal Reserve, they've made it very credible, we're going to do whatever it takes. I think frankly, without some of these extra tools and without Congress going in big, the Fed actually can't do whatever it takes or what it takes. Um, but they've made, uh, Chair Jay Powell has made very clear that they're going to keep at this. And I actually believe the Fed more. And yet when inflation starts moving above two, like it's going to, they're really going to have to clamp down. We saw in the last recession that Congress walked away when the unemployment rate was high. And actually they started cutting spending, right? So, right. so we don't have a great track record in D.C. of doing the right thing. I mean, there are reasons why, and people get scared, and you know, it's hard to be an elected official. I wouldn't want to be Fed chair, like you know. So, you can understand why it happens. But if you plan ahead of time and you have rules, then we can all talk about them. We can run them through simulations, and then when like the whole world falls apart, you got a plan, right? So, um, yeah. So that's both, both in monetary policy and fiscal policy, and that's something that like isn't new but it come, it comes into fashion and goes out and like what those frameworks are change over time but it's a really important principle that is happily getting a lot of discussion I mean, it's yeah no my, my rule you could say is in the spirit of the psalm rule because <laughs> effectively my rule is is a trigger for fiscal policy to meld with monetary policy temporarily Mm -hmm. And it needs a rule, just like it's your rule. I mean, you, you want to have boundaries set for it clearly because it could be abused. But times like this, you really need the traction that comes from, you know, from a rule like that. I mean, it's not just to protect us on the upside from inflation. It's to protect us from the downside we're in right now. Because like you said, people are losing interest and a rule keeps them focused on what's at hand. Yeah, no, that's really really helpful okay so so this has been a really good conversation i do want to you know we've gotten people to hang with us on monetary policy and okay we love it a lot but i'm not sure everyone else can stay with too long but i do want to give you a chance like what haven't we covered or what like if you were like what's the one thing that you you really would want to see happen with the federal reserve or the one thing you'd want people to understand about what's happening and what needs to happen well, again, I, I would go back to my point about stabilizing the dollar size of the economy. I mean, the way I framed it originally when I wrote a piece about this, and I still think about it now, is we're fighting a war. There's going to be some big expenditures, but those expenditures should be viewed as an investment in our future, not just outright spending. This is not a garden variety recession. This is a war. And you want to spend the money, both fiscal policy, monetary policy, but you want some kind of framework, some kind of guardrail, some kind of direction. How do you spend? How much do you spend? And in my view of the world, you want to maintain the dollar size people thought they were going to have going into this. So 22 trillion or so, we've stopped falling below that. We're going to have secondary spillover effects. We can avoid that. That's a policy choice. We can't avoid the fact that some things are scarce, some things are more expensive, but we can't avoid unnecessary bankruptcies and insolvencies. And that's, it's, it's literally some policy levers we could pull, Congress could pull, um, and it's a, it's a choice. We can choose to make this crisis worse than it is, or we can choose to minimize the loss 
and, and a nominal income level target would guide both Congress and the Fed. And it needs to be right in front of them. And Stephen Mnuchin, when he wakes up in the morning, should see <laughs> where are we relative to where we should be in terms of nominal income. Same thing with Chair Powell. That should be, you know, what's on their mind every day. What have I done today to get us closer to where we should be? No. Yeah, no, I would love to take down the deficit clock that's in Congress and put up their nominal income for everyone in the country. Like that's what they should be looking at every Absolutely. day. So, yeah. and, and I think, you know, to put in, uh, you know, to really emphasize your point, like we know what works. Like this is a, this is a choice policymakers have today. You can either do what needs to be done or you can't or you don't, right? right? And so I think that's that's a very hopeful thing. Like we learned so many lessons from the Great Recession and that wasn't that long ago. And we understand that there are limits to the tools the Fed has. I mean, for decades, economists said, the Fed's got this, like they know what they're doing. And then it was like, oh wow, <laughs> the tools the Fed yeah. has always used actually aren't, like either they're not as effective or they just like, you were done with them and you had to go on to other tools. And so there's a real understanding that, oh, Congress needs to act too. But in a lot of ways, that toolkit had been neglected and, and thinking about how to do that right. But wow, we learned, we learned a lot about what to do and what not to do in the Great Recession. And in some ways, and you, you've contributed to that thing about monetary policy. I have, a lot of other people have, and yet it is really hard to watch those lessons not be applied because um, it's kind of like oh my god the train is coming again <laughs> um but you know yeah yeah you're we're right. all Keynesians in a foxhole i keep hoping that we'll pull it out because if we don't like the cost of not getting things back on track are just too big um anyways but like we're we're gonna keep you know beating the drum and uh absolutely fingers crossed so. well, let, me, let me put a little plug in if i may for um a measure we have at the Mercatus Center is called the nominal GDP gap or nominal income gap. But basically, it's a measure of where nominal income should be based on what people thought coming in. So we look at forecast, dollar level forecast, and nominal income 20 quarters leading up to the present one. And it provides a nice benchmark. It's not some, you know, it's, it's a nice exercise based purely on forecast, not based on some mysterious R squared or U squared start some <laughs> unobservable variable, but it says, this is where we should be, this is where we are. And we've provided it for this very purpose. We want policymakers to wake up again, you know, Steve Mnuchin, if you're listening, look at the indicator, <laughs> see where it is. You know, President Trump, if you're, if you're listening, <laughs> you too, I mean, all the above, um, check it out. We, we have a webpage called Nominal GDP Gap, you Google, it'll pop right up, but it's, okay. it's the push us in that direction. Yeah, well, you should, every morning, you should tweet this out. I know Jay Powell follows you on Twitter. So, I mean, like, you can sure. at least get it front and center to him. And That's a good suggestion. Yeah. I haven't been vigilant enough, so I'll do that. Thank you. All right, we'll get that number up there. All right, well, thank you so much, David. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking some time to, to share your passion of monetary policy with all of us. Well, thank you, too. It's always a treat to chat with you, Claudia. Yeah, thanks.